is Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Every week on Science Fantastic, we profile some of the most amazing developments that are changing the way we view the world and the universe itself. Well, with us today is an evolutionary biologist talking to us about the future, the future of humanity. What will humans look like in the future? The book is called Future Humans, Inside the Science of Our Continuing Evolution. And we're very glad to have with us today Professor Scott Solomon. He's an evolutionary biologist at Rice University and a professor in the Department of Biosciences. And with us today is Professor Scott Solomon. He's an evolutionary biologist and professor at, the, at Rice University in the Department of Biosciences. And he's written a great book. I highly recommend it. It's called Future Humans, Inside the Science of Our Continuing Evolution. So does evolution have a direction? Where is Homo sapiens going into the future? So, uh, Scott, glad you could be on Science. Fantastic. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. First question for you is, how did you, as a youth, as a young boy, first get interested in science and then biology? Yeah, so I grew up as a kid, like like many kids, that you know, spent a lot of time outdoors. And uh, for me, I think science and nature were really kind of intertwined as a child. Um, I spent a lot of time digging for dinosaur bones in my backyard. And although I never found right? any, I, I, uh, I always imagined that I might. And um, I think it, it, it helped my imagination to, to, uh, to think about maybe going off uh, you know, to places beyond my backyard and to to make ex- uh, discoveries and and to explore. So that okay, yeah. And then, what got you interested in evolutionary biology? Right. So I actually started college um, imagining that I would become a doctor. I was a, a pre med student at University of Illinois. And, um, you know, part of that was because I, at the time, didn't understand how many options there are for careers in science, uh, in particular in biology, other than in medicine. And so I sort of thought if you like biology and you want to have a career, that you become a doctor. And so it was during um, my time in college that I started getting involved in research in some of the uh, labs of professors at my university that I discovered that there are other ways that uh, that people study um, science and study biology and apply their knowledge to to make discoveries and um, and that was fascinating to me and but really the thing that clinched it for me was I had an amazing opportunity one of my professors invited me to be his research assistant in the Galapagos Islands uh, the professor's name was Martin Wachelski and he was working on marine iguanas in the Galapagos Islands and he gave me just the chance of a lifetime to go down there with him and we spent a few days camping on an uninhabited island in Galapagos and studying these marine iguanas and I was hooked I just thought wow how do I get to do something like this in my life and that's what made me decide to um, apply for the PhD programs in, um, in evolutionary biology Okay, now, when I was a kid, I used to read a lot of science fiction. And in science fiction, universally, they paint a picture of where humans are going in the next thousand, ten thousand years. Universally, we're going to have gigantic heads. We've been getting bigger and bigger and smarter and smarter, so we're going to have gigantic heads. We'll be bald. We'll lose our hair. We've been losing hair for hundreds of thousands of years. And we'll have very small bodies because we don't really need to be strong anymore. So we'll be gigantic brains. Now, doesn't that violate what we know about evolution? So tell us a little bit about whether or not our brains are getting bigger or, in fact, maybe getting smaller since the time of the Neanderthals. Yeah, that's right. So you're, you're touching on some of the, the trends in our uh, evolutionary past in which um, our heads initially expanded dramatically, of course, what made us distinct from our, from our primate um, cousins. Um, but then there more recently had been a tr- has been a trend towards uh, to somewhat smaller heads, certainly compared with some of the uh, other 
species of humans that we once shared the earth with. But if we look at what's happening today, the evolutionary forces that are at work on humans today, which is the, the, the subject that I cover in, in my book, Future Humans, what we see is that Natural selection and other evolutionary forces are still at play, but they're operating in ways that are quite different from how they've operated in the past. So to touch on some of the, the specific aspects of the human body that you were asking about, the head is something that we, we do know quite a bit about. Um, and actually, the size of the head has been constrained throughout our evolutionary history by having to fit through the birth canal. So the human head expanded dramatically throughout uh, the course of, of, um, of our evolutionary past but it could only become so large because babies still have to pass through the birth canal. So that has imposed an upper limit, a maximum size on how big our heads could become. But there is something interesting about what's happening today related to head size, and that is that as cesarean sections become a more and more common way for births to happen, and in fact, in the U.S., they uh, make up about 30% of all births. Um, in Brazil, they make up uh, 50% or more of all births. And so as these cesarean sections become more common, it is sort of freeing up that constraint. The head uh, doesn't have to fit through the birth canal, and so it is sort of freed up to become larger. Now, if we get to a point in which C-sections become the only way that births happen, and there's a number of reasons why that could happen, um, that would then free up our head to continue to expand um, to, you know, perhaps look something like the depictions from science fiction. So it's not entirely outside of the realm of possibility that our heads could become much larger in the future if C-sections become a much more common form of birth or even if they become the only way that births happen. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. In this hour, we're going to talk about the future of the human race. Not the future of the universe, as we usually talk about, but the future of humanity itself. Where are we going? The book is called Future Humans, Inside the Science of Our Continuing Evolution. The author is Professor Scott Solomon. He's a professor at Rice University in the Department of Biosciences. So we're talking about, well, what are humans going to look like in the future? Now, Charles Darwin once said that, well, a lot of evolution is directed by the female. The female chooses which male to mate. And then the question boils down to is, well, what do females want? What do women want? Do women want men with gigantic heads? I mean, do they want nerdy men that are super smart? Why did we become intelligent if women selected smart men, differentiating ourselves from the Neanderthals and early men? Some people say that it's not nerdy smart that women select for. It's the smart that allows you to survive. The smart that allows you to outwit enemies and provide shelter. In other words, success. Whether success is financial success or success in the jungle, that's what women want. And then the question is, a byproduct of that is a big brain. So does that theory hold up that women basically choose which way evolution is going to go? So women choose not the so-called nerdy men, but men who are successful, whatever success means, success in the forest or success on Wall Street. Yeah, this is a great question. So you're right that, that the idea that there's something other than just survival that matters to our evolution was, uh, was one of Darwin's other major contributions in addition to natural selection, the idea of sexual selection, as he called it. And so, um, one of the things that really interested me when I was doing the research for, uh, for my book, Future Humans, was to discover that we actually know much less about how mate choice decisions happen, about how sexual selection operates in humans than we know 
from other species. We know actually a lot more about this process in birds and insects and many other species than we know about humans. And um, in part, that's because we can't perform the same types of experiments on humans that we uh, uh, sometimes perform on, on other species. But some of the things that we have learned are that uh, there are, in fact, cues that have evolved in our past to give us information in making uh, mate choice decisions. As you said, um, in most species, this is typically the female who is selecting her mate and choosing certain qualities, certain attributes of the male when making those mate choice decisions. So intelligence uh, does seem to be an important factor, uh, not surprising, but there are other factors as well that, su that seem to be really important um, in human mate choice decisions, and they have to do with actually some of physical characteristics like symmetry, how symmetrical a person's face is has a big influence on how attractive people generally find that person to be. But there are other cues as well, including body odor. So it turns out that women are incredibly good at using smell, using odor cues to actually get information about, um, about men. And so, for example, women are able to use scent and smell of a man to determine things like how closely related that man is to her. So this is thought to have evolved to uh, prevent women from um, having romantic relationships with close relatives. But today, we're starting to modify those cues, right? We cover up our odors. We use perfumes and deodorants and, and other types of things in ways that might actually be affecting those mate choice decisions that evolved in our ancestors. So there are quite a lot of these types of cues, um, and, um, and, and we're learning more about them. But what we're seeing is that the, the way in which that process is playing out today seems to be quite different from how it's played out in the past. Okay, now also in your book, you talk about computer dating. I mean, years ago, thousands of years ago, we lived in small tribes, maybe about a 100 people, let's say, and so your mate choice was very limited as a consequence. You were basically a nomad going from one hunting ground to the next hunting ground. But now we have, of course, the Internet, and we have computer dating. So how is that going to change human evolution? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's something that, um, that I actually write about in the book because, um, as I was just describing, we use these, these cues in choosing our romantic partners that we're often um, we're not necessarily aware that those are the factors that, that are affecting how attractive we, we find a person to be. Um, but the use of, of online dating or dating apps, the use of the Internet in, uh, in finding our romantic partners may actually be playing a really large Large role in our evolution today because it can really bias who ends up meeting up with whom. So if you think about a, a dating app or an online dating website as being sort of an initial filtering step that might determine who ends up going out on a first date, well, in that case, there are certain types of information that are available about another person, especially some um, uh, visual information, a photograph, right, a picture. But things like odor are not certainly not available, right? So until somebody develops a scratch and sniff dating app, <laughs> uh, we don't have the ability to use odor cues in the same way that we would use, as you were just describing, in an in-person encounter. If you meet somebody one-on-one, -on -one, whether you realize it or not, the smell of that person might actually be influencing how you feel about that person and could make you uh, romantically attracted to that person. So these types of cues are biasing us in ways that we don't really realize and aren't necessarily paying attention to, but could lead to evolutionary changes in our ability to use perhaps new types of information. Perhaps we start to use visual cues in new ways, or we start to rely on other types of cues for making made choice decisions. Okay, now on the other end of the spectrum, some people say that evolution has stopped for the most part, because of course we no longer have things like Australia. Australia was a bottleneck 
it was a continent that broke off, and animals on that continent had a limited mating choice. And so evolution accelerated in Australia. That's why we have marsupials and kangaroos. But we no longer have these bottlenecks anymore. In fact, we have airplanes. And with airplanes, we can cut across any bottleneck. And so as a consequence, evolution has stopped. Plus the fact that, for the most part, if you're middle class, you no longer have to worry about where your next meal is going to come from. Therefore, you're not going to choose your mate choice on that basis. So what are your thoughts about those people who think that what you see today is what you see tomorrow? Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you asked because this is actually – this was one of the main motivations for me to write my book, uh, Future Humans, because the idea that human evolution came to an end um, has been fairly widespread up until recently. And um, what I wanted to do in the book is to basically lay out all of the evidence that currently exists that I think convincingly shows that evolution has not ended and that has continued up until modern times and is still playing out today. So there's really three main Main lines of evidence that I go through in the book that show that human evolution is still happening. One of those is genetic and genomic information. So when we sequence the human genome, all of the DNA that makes up the instruction manual for how to make a living organism, we can actually see the telltale signature of natural selection. It actually leaves a mark in the DNA, and we can look for that signature in our DNA and actually ask what types of of genes are being affected by natural selection. And we can then get information about how natural selection has been affecting us in the past. Um, so that's one piece of information. The other piece of information that shows that our evolution is, has continued comes from population databases. So a great example of this is uh, churches. Churches tend to keep records of births, deaths, and marriages. And that information can be used by evolutionary biologists to reconstruct not only the relationships among individual people, but also the age at which women start having children. And it turns out that the age at which women start having children has actually been under natural selection. It's been evolving within in just the last couple of centuries. Once again, you're listening to Science Fantastic. The book is called Future of Humans. Our special guest today is Professor Scott Solomon. with Professor Michio Kaku. Today we're talking about the future, not the future of black holes or the future of the Big Bang of the universe. No, we're talking about the future of you and me and Homo sapiens and the human race. The book is called Future Humans, Inside the Science of Our Continuing Evolution. Yes, we are still evolving, but in what direction? With us today is Professor Scott Solomon. He's a professor at Rice University in Texas in the Department of Biosciences. So, um, Scott, when we left, left off, we were talking about the fact that most people would say that evolution has pretty much stopped because, well, if you're middle class, you can always have kids. There's no selection pressure being placed on you. And for that matter, there are no bottlenecks like Australia. Uh, we can have airplanes that can cut across all bottlenecks. And with computer dating, we can cut across all sorts of different kinds of bottlenecks. So what are your thoughts? Right. So the simplest way to think about how evolution is still affecting our species today is to recognize that people have different numbers of children. And as long as that is true, there will always be an opportunity for natural selection to operate because whichever traits make it more likely that a person has a few more children than the other people in their population, those traits will become more common in future generations. And that's really what natural selection is. And so there have been studies that have demonstrated that this is still happening. So I was starting to talk about how church records can actually be used to get at this information. What we can see from church records, from records of birth, deaths, and marriages, is that on average, women who start having children earlier in life tend to have more children over the span of their lifetimes. So what that means is that natural selection tends to favor women who start having children at a younger age because they tend to pass on more copies of their genes to later generations. 
And so this is interesting because in many societies, including in the in the United States, um, women are tending to wait to start having families. So that actually represents a great example of how natural selection can be pulling on a trait in one direction, favoring earlier start to families. And society and culture can be pulling on that same trait in the opposite direction, encouraging a later start to families. So it's really not true that natural selection and evolution has stopped for us. It's merely changed the factors that are influencing the number of children that we have and, uh, uh, and, and also how long we survive. Those factors are being influenced by our modern lives. So okay. another example. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go on. Go on. Oh, I was just going to say that another example of, of evidence for this actually comes from uh, large-scale biomedical studies. So the Framingham Heart Study um, is a great example of this. It began in the, in the 1940s in Framingham, Massachusetts, right outside of Boston. And they've been following the same cohort of people uh, to just monitor their, their, their health um, since the 1940s. And they've also recruited other cohorts of people who are the children of the original cohort. So what that does is it gives um, evolutionary biologists the ability to look at what are the factors that are associated with people that tend to have more children versus those that tend to have less children. And they've identified certain characteristics. So some of them are, are a little bit you know, more intuitive, like having a total lower cholesterol level um, you know, tends to be healthier. And so those people tend to survive longer and have more opportunities to reproduce. But there have been some other factors that have been... Um, have been linked in that study that I that I also talk about in the book. Okay, uh, let's take another short commercial break. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Today we're talking about the future. Not the future of the universe, but the future of Homo sapiens. The future of you and me. The future of the human race itself. With us today is Professor Scott Solomon, Professor of Biosciences at Rice University in Texas. The book is called Future Humans. Inside the Science of Our Continuing Evolution. Now, some people say that sperm counts have been declining among men, while female fertility rates have been rising. Now, talking about males, the Y chromosome, some people say, has been getting smaller and smaller over the millennia. And some people even predict that one day, the Y chromosome, which defines men, will disappear. So maybe in the future, we won't have men anymore. But what are your thoughts about the disappearing Y chromosome and the declining sperm count? Yeah, this is a really fascinating phenomenon, and um, it's actually not unique to humans. So we've actually been able to observe the same process playing out in other species in which the Y chromosome gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and it has occurred in some other species that the Y chromosome actually ceases to exist. It actually disappears. Um, but interestingly, what happens in those species is not that they stop having males. What actually happens is the genes that are responsible for making a male, which in our species and many others is on the Y chromosome, that gene actually ends up getting sort of copied and pasted onto a different chromosome. So in effect, a different chromosome becomes the chromosome that makes a male a male. And so we believe that if that process were to play out in humans, something similar would take place, that it wouldn't result in you know, the, the disappearance of males, it would just transfer the uh, the genes for maleness from the Y chromosome to to one of the other chromosomes. But the declining fertility is something that is um, is quite concerning, and so we're seeing a rise in uh, couples seeking fertility treatment across much of the world, um, and this has evolutionary consequences because it 
could uh, reach a point at which the uh, assisted reproductive technologies that are used to treat couples uh, um, who are hoping to to, um, to start a family, we could actually, as a species, become more and more dependent on those technologies, which by itself isn't necessarily problematic as long as those technologies continue to exist. We'd like to hope that we'll continue to develop new and better ways um, to uh, to treat infertility, um, but it could actually affect us from an evolutionary point of view if we get to a point where we really need to have those technologies in order to conceive a child. Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. With us today is Scott Solomon, author of the book Future Humans, Inside the Science of Our Continuing Evolution. So we are talking about the future of the human race. Well, one thing we didn't touch upon, which you touch upon in your book, is the question of birth control, contraception. For the first time in human history, just within the last several decades, we've been able to alter alter the whole course of the human race with contraception. How has that changed evolution, if at all? Right. So one of the interesting things about uh, how contraception, birth control, has affected our evolution has to do with mate choice decisions. As we were talking about earlier, Darwin recognized that when females choose their partners, that has a big influence on which genes get passed on to the next generation. And so those choices have uh, the, the, the traits that females choose in their partners is one of the most important traits for evolution. And we talked about how odor smell is one of the traits that we know in humans has been used in making mate choice decisions. This is related to contraception and birth control because studies have shown that women who are taking hormonal birth control pills lose the ability to use smell as a way of getting information about men. So it seems that um, like online dating, this is one of the ways in which modern life is affecting our ability to use the cues that our ancestors evolved to be able to make sort of informed mate choice decisions. Hmm. Okay, now also in your book, you talk about the far future when we might be able to edit our genes deliberately. We have something called CRISPR technology, which allows scientists to actually tinker with the the genome directly. And so what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts about what happens when in the future we can have designer children and people will be able to choose the direction of their children genetically? Yeah, so this is one of the the possible ways in which our evolutionary future could really go in a completely different direction um, compared to anything that we've seen in our evolutionary past. And so the ability, the technology to to do this actually already exists. As As you mentioned, the CRISPR technology is already being used in research laboratories around the world to make precise, deliberate changes to DNA. But the reason that this could have evolutionary consequences is if we make changes to the DNA of cells that are going to be passed on to later generations, so if we edit the DNA of uh, sperm or egg cells, those changes get passed on to the next generation, which will then pass them on to, to the subsequent generation and so on. So what this means is that we have, in theory, the ability to actually guide or control our own evolution. So this could mean that, for example, we can uh, eliminate certain genetic diseases like sickle cell disease, which is caused by just a single DNA base pair change, a single letter in the DNA alphabet can be edited and changed to eliminate that disease. However, it could also bring about other types of changes. You mentioned uh, designer babies. This is something that people have talked about for many years, but we're close to being able to actually do this for better or for worse. In other words, we could choose the hair color, the eye color, and other types of attributes that don't necessarily have anything to do with survival or well-being, and they could be passed on to later generations. But we really need to understand more about our own genetics, about how these genes operate, 
before we can get to a point where we can be comfortable making changes without uh, having any unintended consequences. Now, every parent would like to get the smart gene to give to their children. However, some psychologists say that there could be hundreds, maybe thousands of genes involved in the so-called smartness of a human being. And so perhaps we're going to go overboard and have a wild goose chase finding genes uh, for which there's no single gene, but maybe hundreds of genes that control smartness and intelligence. What are your thoughts? Yes, that's exactly what, what I was alluding to earlier. So I gave the example of sickle cell disease as being something that we, we understand is caused by only not only a single gene, but a single uh, uh, DNA letter that has changed. But that is a very unusual situation. Most traits that we are aware of, and intelligence is one of those traits, is not caused by, is not uh, determined by just a single gene, but as you, as you mentioned, um, often by hundreds or even thousands thousands of genes, and each one of those genes by itself has only a really small effect on the actual trait, like intelligence. So first of all, we would need to better understand what each one of those genes is. We would need to understand what precise changes to make, but we also need to be sure that those traits, aren't, those genes aren't having any other effect in the body. Very often, a single gene has uh, genes, what they do in the, in the body is they make protein. And those proteins can go on and do all different sorts of things. It's often more than just one role that they play in the body. So we need to make sure we understand not only how each of those genes contributes to intelligence, but also what other roles those genes might play in the body. And wouldn't it be almost impossible to stop the spread of certain genes that are illegal? I mean, we cannot stop the flow of drugs. Uh, genes are information. You can send that on the Internet. It's just a coding of ATCG, and you can send it right on the Internet as pure information. So would it be in the future a problem if certain genes are considered illegal because they're too dangerous or whatever, but how do you stop it given the fact we can barely stop the drug trade any thoughts yeah you're bringing up a really important point so um, exactly what you're describing is uh, is one of the concerns that uh, that many people have about okay Scott that. unfortunately we run out of time but once again if you want to find out more about his work the book is called future humans inside the science of our continuing evolution so Scott thank you so much for being on science fantastic thank you it was a real pleasure and once again, you are listening to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku.